Preview 1, Alexis de Tocqueville. NBC invites you to listen to the first of two discussion programs previewing NBC's dramatic radio series, Democracy in America, based on the classic work of Alexis de Tocqueville, a young French nobleman who visited the United States in 1831-1832, at the time of President Andrew Jackson. De Tocqueville was so impressed with our new young nation that he wrote Democracy in America, acclaimed all over the world as the definitive book on America. It's interesting to note, Tocqueville's precepts are almost as true today as when they were first written. This weekly series of 14 half-hour dramatizations of American democratic life, based on de Tocqueville's book, will have its world premiere on the NBC radio network one week from tonight, Wednesday, January the 17th, at the same time, over most of these NBC stations. And now, preview one, Alexis de Tocqueville. And here is your moderator, Dorothy Gordon, known to you as the founder and moderator of Youth Forums and author of the book, You and Democracy, a book for children. Miss Gordon. Well, here we are, sitting at a table in America, a Frenchman and an American woman, to talk about our American way of life. Now, Alexis de Tocqueville probably did the same thing when he was in America in 1831. Don't you think so, Mr. Morris here? Yes, Miss Gordon. In fact, you know, de Tocqueville wrote about the women in this country in his book, Democracy in America. And I think, if I can remember, that he attributed the singular prosperity and strength of the people here to the superiority of the women. I think he maybe he was right. <laughs> oh, well, that's very good of you. And, of course, the women cannot object to that, although it took some time for the men to realize it, let me tell you. In the series of broadcasts that we're introducing, there is one devoted to the women as de Tocqueville saw them here. And, incidentally, I'm afraid I'm failing in my duty as a woman. Oh, I think it's impossible. I don't believe it. But uh, in what way? Well, a very good friend, but you know I failed to introduce you. I do want to do that. Now, Monsieur Edouard Morosier is a cultural counselor to the French Embassy here in the United States. He represents the French universities and is a liaison between the universities in France and those here in America. He's a professor of philosophy and author of books in philosophy and innumerable articles. He's been responsible for much of the Franco-American cultural exchange programs I ought to know because he arranged my trip to France and my youth forum broadcasts over there. So you see, he was a logical person to help us introduce to you the De Tocqueville series, which will start on the NBC radio network January 17th. We also have two young people with us, a French student and an American. Uh, we'll ask them to introduce themselves. Will you, Joan? My name is Joan Healy, and I'm a freshman at Marymount Manhattan College. And, uh, Joan? My name is Jean-Michel Giraud, and I'm a student at the French Lycée in New York. Well, now, you just stay by, because uh, I'm going to talk with um, Monsieur Rossier, and then afterwards you're coming into a discussion with us about democracy. Now, Monsieur Morissier, let's talk about the Tocqueville a bit. How do you feel about the idea of a series of broadcasts built around Alexis de Tocqueville's visit to America? It was in 1831. Well, I think it's a, a wonderful idea for many reasons. First, because uh, de Tocqueville's book is the best uh, written in this country or in Europe on the United States. That's a basic book for the understanding of America and democracy. And I think it's to the right time to do it uh, because it is a time for a new understanding of uh, our common ideal of democracy in the United States and in France. Well, does the average Frenchman know the name de Tocqueville? Do the students, are they familiar with the book? As I understand it, de Tocqueville's book, Democracy in America, was hailed immediately as the classic analysis of the society of the United States. And as a Frenchman living here, do you think America has, reserve, has preserved the ideals that de Tocqueville emphasized? Oh, may I quote uh, my own experience? I remember yes. very well when uh, I heard uh, de Tocqueville's name for the first time, it was in a high school in Paris at the beginning of a course of uh, my teacher on the history of the United States. And he told us, well, there is only one book you have to read about the United States, that's Democracy in America, and uh, nobody since that time uh, did better. Well, you read the book in French, of course. In French at that time, yes. yes. But I think that uh, all of the French students uh, heard about uh, de Tocqueville uh, one day or another, 
and as you know, de Tocqueville is really the best interpreter of the United States, and for the political scientist, he is a sort of model. Well, do you think that de Tocqueville and his companion, Gustave de Beaumont, were so impressed because they themselves were aristocrats and were not accustomed to see so much equality amongst the people? Yes, I think it's partly true, but I think there is another basic reason for that. It's uh, because uh, the Tocqueville uh, belonged to a general society, you see, in Europe. And, it's, and I think that there, is, there was a special atmosphere in Europe at that time about the United States. The United States was considered as a sort of uh, utopia, a possible realization of democracy. Yes, because I remember that in, in the, uh, one of de Tocqueville's um, sayings, and if I remember it correctly, that he said that he was an aristocrat and never really understood liberty until he came here to the, uh, to the United right. States. That's right, but I think uh, for any unprejudiced uh, Frenchman, uh, the impression would have been the same. Well, now, for instance, when de Tocqueville and Beaumont were to call on the governor of New York, that was in, in that period of the... Uh, middle 19th century, they were astounded to find the governor living in a boarding house in New York City. Uh, to a French aristocrat, this would be very astounding, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, surely. It was a very big surprise. <laughs> yes, but they didn't know that later on our governor would live in Albany in a palace, just oh, as, well, the, as the... Oh, well, of time. <laughs> yes, this is as time moves along. <clears throat> well, you know, the dramatizations and the broadcasts are designed to bring to life the America of the 1830s. And the conversations are based on the actual words of de Tocqueville and Beaumont. Would you like to hear a bit of a scene when the two Frenchmen called on Governor through oh, New pleasure. York? Well, let, let's hear that, shall we? You're taking notes, Mr. Tocqueville. I'm glad to see you do it. Uh, to take a note of this. The American people, dispersed over an immense territory, abounding in all the means of commercial greatness, who early found an opportunity of adapting their government to their circumstances. Adapting their government to their circumstances. And they followed the manifest order of nature when they adopted a constitution which was free, a constitution which was republican, and a constitution which was based on a commercial federation. But, Mr. Governor, was that desirable? Uh, no, sir. I will not comment on its desirability, except to say this. As far as we are concerned, it is infinitely desirable, because it was wholly inevitable. Will you uh, forgive me if I speak for a moment of your own country and speak to you privately as a man? We should be honored. Very well, sir. Your country, too, has recently passed through a great revolution, but one which I cannot help feeling has had a very different influence on your destiny. You will forgive the strong language, but I cannot help but remark that the course, and indeed the catastrophe, of the French Revolution has cast a gloom over republicanism which perhaps it may never shake off, and which renders it, in Europe, repulsive and discreditable, at least for the present. But here, sir, is the difference between your revolution and ours. The American Republic is the natural fruit of the American soil. The spirit of freedom may be impassioned, it may be factious, but it is neither furious nor bloody. The strong bonds of union are here and will remain. There is a common language, there are common laws, there are common political attachments, and finally, and above all, there is the great reciprocal bond of common interest. Remember this always, gentlemen. We live on trade. We live by trade. We live for trade. Trade is our life. And I tell you frankly, we all regard the carrying on of trade as something to which a man may honorably devote his whole life. And indeed, while we are talking today, a hundred ships are discharging their cargoes and a thousand emigrants from all parts of the globe are landing with big hearts and stout hopes to realize their dreams of a free and happy West. Uh, Mushimaru Sia, do you think Governor Throop was correct in the statement he made about the difference in the French Revolution and the one in America as he was talking to, to Monsieur de Tocqueville? 
Well, first, I think he was not absolutely correct when he said that the catastrophe of a bloody and furious French Revolution was responsible for the decline of a democratic faith, because we have not to forget that, after all, the Napoleonic armies spread all over Europe revolutionary ideas, and the 19th century was, in Europe, the, uh, the era of uh, awakening of nationalities and fights for new liberal constitution. But I think that uh, he is right when he opposed a new uh, a revolution in a new country and a revolution in a old country. In the old country, a revolution is a fight for more freedom, for liberty, and it's something very different from uh, the frontier spirit yes, uh, in uh, 1830. Oh, yes, and then the, the difference in the people who came over here yeah. seeking mm. religious liberty. In your position as cultural counselor, do you think that we are building up a culture of our own? I think sincerely. I think you have in this country a great literature, a new uh, school of painting, a unique movement in architecture, and two, and that's part of uh, the definition, the expression of a culture, a, a philosophy of education. It's why I strongly believe in the existence of a unique and original culture of the United States. And maybe too, you know, uh, in uh, our European ideal of culture, we think that uh, a culture has to be expressed by a sort of uh, human ideal, uh, what we call in the 17th century, the 18th century, the honest man, uh, later on the cultivated man or the gentleman. Yeah, But yeah. I think that the United States too, uh, from the beginning, uh, produced Uh, that sort of uh, human ideal. Uh, permit me not to quote uh, living examples, it's a bit too <laughs> delicate or embarrassing, but uh, you have an uh, ideal of cultural pe uh, culture people uh, like uh, Jefferson, Franklin, Emerson, Walt Oh yes, well, Whitman, they were the so pioneers. On. But uh, don't you feel that we did develop a certain type of culture in our music? Jazz, for instance, has it's based on folklore and people don't realize that it really is something original and it is a sort of a contribution to the musical life which has uh, been taken up by countries all over the world. Oh, I think so, and I think that the child uh, really was a revolution in the interpretation of music, and uh, I remember that very well in, uh, after the First World War. Yeah, you you uh, got your first impression of jazz at that time. Oh, yes. Uh, we, we are. Well, you know, I'd like you to hear another excerpt. This gives de Tocqueville's reaction to the at emphasis on trade. As the two men left the governor's boarding house, they heard the street sounds characteristic of the 1830s. Now let us listen to it and, and pretend that we're there. More noise. There is a band now. Surely the streets of New York must be the noisiest and busiest in the world. And yet, for all their bustle and prosperity, I feel all the time that we are walking about in a city which is nothing but one gigantic suburb. There they go, across the end of the street. Flags, banners, bands. What can all this be? I can hardly believe my own eyes. This is a parade of tradesmen, of mechanics. Look at them, look at the banners. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. It is miraculous. Did you ever see such assurance, such confidence, such calm complacency with which these fellows hold up all the traffic? And listen to the cheers of the people. Yes, the governor told us that these people think that the carrying on of trade is something to which a man may honorably devote his whole life. And look at their clothes. Sleek coats, glossy hats, gay watch cards, and doe skin gloves. Hey there, look at the dandy mechanics. Give them three cheers, boys. Three cheers for the dandy mechanics. <laughs> Mechanics. 
mechanics. It is the right name for them. There is an unbelievable outward equality in America. The whole country has melted into a middle class. A remarkable thing. A country blessed with nature's richest gifts and selected by providence for the noblest experiment tried by man, which is not only the civilization of a new world, but the practical establishment of principles that till now have only had an ideal existence. A great people which has no army, a country full of activity and vigor where the action of the government is hardly perceived. A world given up to trade and equality and proud of both. And of course, it has a great deal more dramatization mm -hmm. in, the, in the rest of the series. Um, and then, as you heard, de Tocqueville emphasized equality. How do you think of the word equality? Are all men created equal? Would you oh, say? Oh, that's a very important and philosophical question. It's very <laughs> difficult to answer. But no, I think that it's not uh, a, a fact, but uh, an uh, ideal. We have to work for the equality of people. Well, it's really, isn't it really that men are created equal, in other words, to have the equal opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is, which is our Jeffersonian um, ideal of democracy? You know that we have um, two young people here in the studio with us. Uh, one is a Frenchman and a young American. And we're going to have the young people talk with each other and with us. And Jean-Michel, I'm going to ask you, you, you know that de Tocqueville was here for 10 months when he wrote this book, which became such a famous classic. How long have you been in America? Well, I've been here five years now. Oh, we expect a great big long book out of you. As you listen to us and to the excerpts, uh, do you feel that... that um, De Tocqueville was justified in his impassioned feeling about liberty for all men. Well, I certainly think that America and the United States is quite a good example of, of democratic realization. John? Uh, I would say that he had a reason for being so enthused, but I believe that if he lived now at the present time, he would have even greater reasons, because since the time that de Tocqueville was here, we have had much greater advances, such as in civil rights legislation and other such legislation, where uh, he could see that his total views of equality would be realized. Uh, he seems to think only of the working class, the uh, increase in their powers, but I should think that the slaves uh, being freed and other such changes would uh, make him even more elated than he was at that time. Uh, Jean-Michel, now, you're a Frenchman, you're living here. How do you compare life here? And uh, how do you feel about the young people in this country, their liberties and their freedoms? Do you think that they're freer here than they are in, in France? What do you mean, uh, point of view from the parents or from the uh, state? I mean... Uh... Well, mean, I, uh, I mean, well, let's take a social, from a social standpoint. Do you think that um, the young people here express themselves more freely, perhaps, than, uh, um, than the young people do in France? We'll ask uh, Monsieur Mauvoisier. He's smiling there across the table. We uh, let's hear uh, Jean-Michel. Yes, has to say. Go ahead, Jean. Well, uh, I don't know quite exactly, but I think... Uh, that uh, in here you have more extracurricular activities and uh, uh, younger students write papers about the more personal subjects and are, uh, are trained to do this kind of work and to express themselves maybe more freely than uh, in France. Uh, that is, they do express themselves, but I'm sure that French students don't bother to express themselves if they w wish to. <laughs> Joan, uh, are you familiar at all with, with foreign students? Do you find that the foreign students are as free in their, in their opinions and in their expressions as um, the American young people are? Yes, I do, but I don't believe that they're as uh, partisan as the American students would be towards such uh, things as communism. I know in recent polls taken in France, there has been much different opinion on such issues, and I think that the American student more realizes the danger uh, 
up against his country of certain influences in the world than a student in another country, they don't seem to, they seem to think more in terms of economic uh, alleviation at the present time rather than uh, changes, rather than... Um, mm. Well, uh, uh, Jean-Michel, it seems to me that Joan has thrown a challenge out to you. Yes, <laughs> well... <laughs> Very much so. I do not uh, uh, do quite agree, agree you because... You don't agree, uh, but go ahead and tell us... That I think that, personally, that I, in France you have a wider choice in uh, what you want to think. I mean, uh, here in America, you can help it, but uh, if you have uh, more socialistic ideas, then uh, it's generally the opinion here. Then uh, you don't quite feel free to express yourself. I mean, uh, uh, but in France, since there are almost all kinds of parties, political parties, you're always oh, yes. free to well, join the one you want. How many political parties do you have in France? Well, <laughs> how many? Not too Which many about? now. Not but too many now. In the but, present parliament. But still, you can either be, I don't know, a royalist even, or a communist. Uh, Mr. Marcia, you spend a great deal of time with young people, I know. Do you agree with Jean-Michel or, uh, um, or with Joanne? Oh, that's a very, very complicated uh, thing to answer, because I know very well uh, university circles in France and in the United States. Uh, Yes, it's true that uh, maybe the American student express himself uh, more easily than the French ones. But uh, in the counterpart, I think that the French students maybe is uh, more trained uh, to get a critical mind. And I remember I was a professor uh, a few years ago, and uh, we, were, we were all used in France to say, well, you have to discuss and to take a decision by yourself. So if we speak of uh, liberty as a, a critical mind, I think the French student can compete very easily with the American one. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Joanne, now you, it's your chance to defend yourself <laughs> and the American student. My point of view was that the American student takes more of an interest, say, against, as I said before, communism or other elements in our society which might be dangerous to our future existence. Whereas the, well, I'm, I'm interrupting a minute, Joan, but I want to ask you, would you say that, that the American student feels the same way towards the extreme right? You use the word communist. What about the fascist? Because uh, is the answer perhaps that uh, uh, the, the answer is the middle road, the center, like your center party, mm -hmm. which has always been so strong in France, Mr. Moser. Do you, do you find that the American student is anti-communist only or is the, is the American student also anti-fascist? Well, I believe the average American student is sort of the middle of the road. However, the most domineering students at the present time, those who have the most interest, seem to be those interested in the conservatism and those who are trying to fight communism. Therefore, I should think, since they are the more dominant element in the student body, since they are more forceful, that it would be their opinion which would be heard. Is it liberty, freedom of expression that bothers you? You feel that the French students can talk about communism. And that doesn't mean that they are communists, does it? No, no, absolutely not. No, there isn't this communist fear that there is here in France because uh, there is a communist body which is, uh, I think, getting a little weaker now. And, uh, and uh, I don't know... <laughs> Monsieur Marossier, what would you say about that? Do you think that there isn't the fear of communism in, in France, would you say, that there is here? Well, it's not exactly uh, the same problem, you see. Yes. I would say that the fight uh, against communism uh, is not uh, pursued the same way in France and uh, in the United States because of uh, very clear historical reasons, you see. Yes. It's why I think it's very difficult to compare in the time and uh, to say that maybe the French students or the American students are, have, have a stronger feeling for freedom. I think the feeling for freedom is uh, as strong in this country as it is in France. Well, um, you know, we have the, in, in relation to these broadcasts, um, there was a book that was edited by George Probst of New York, University who who worked on the record, on the programs too, called the Happy Republic. It's a, a reader in in Tocqueville's America, and it's quite an extraordinary book. You have a copy of it. Yes, I, know. I was very happy to get a copy, and I think it's a very 
an excellent book. Well, I think, and this is related to the mm. to the broadcast, and and uh, I personally feel it should be read by all the young people everywhere because the amount of research that went into it, and uh, I never realized how many French writers there were that had written about. Um, about uh, America with a tremendous amount of interest. But there is one phrase here that I, I'm looking at now that I'd like to quote from and, and like to get an idea uh, how Jean-Michel and Joanne feel. Uh, he said, the first of the duties that are at this time imposed upon uh, those who direct our affairs is to educate democracy, to reawaken, if possible, its religious beliefs, to purify its morals, to regulate its actions. Now, do you young people feel at all that democracy is taken for granted a great deal? Yes, John. Uh, I believe that at the present time, we do not take de democracy for granted. Uh, we, there are many, as I have mentioned before, conservatives who are fighting for different causes, and one of them is for equality under the law. We have it now in words. It is stated that we do have equality under the law. However, we know that in many areas, Negroes are being denied their rights, and other minority groups are being denied their rights. Therefore, it is the aim of students now to bring forth, to change the situation so that our democracy will be in reality, a living democracy, will be practiced for every single individual in the United States. Well, how do you feel about fashion? Well, I think it's quite a noble purpose. Well, but do you, feel, do you feel that, uh, that uh, democracy is under fire today? But I think, uh, as the Dougville said, the main uh, thing about democracy is, to, is education, to get people educated and able to choose and to act for themselves toward a better democracy. Oh, I'm, I'm going to come to you, Monsieur Morosier, on that question. That again, I fully agree with the Tocqueville, uh, because I think that uh, it's true that democracy is a permanent fight, a personal and a collective fight, and we have to n never to forget that uh, we have to keep democracy we have to be uh, very uh, cautious and uh, to be real fighters, uh, not in education and uh, in politics. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think this is a wonderful note on which to close our program. It was so good of you, Monsieur Maurice, to come. And you, Jean-Michel Giraud. I want to get your name right. And Joan Healy. Uh, I've been very excited and interested in this whole thing, and I'm sure that everyone else will be. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Ms. Thank Gordon. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Gordon. You have been listening to Preview One, Alexis de Tocqueville, the first of two discussion programs previewing NBC's dramatic radio series, Democracy in America, based on the classic work of Alexis de Tocqueville. This weekly series of 14 half-hour dramatizations of American democratic life will have its world premiere on the NBC radio network one week from tonight, Wednesday, January the 17th, at this same time, over most of these NBC stations. Our moderator was Dorothy Gordon, who had as her special guest Monsieur Edouard Morosir, the cultural counselor to the French embassy, and two students, Joan Healy and Jean-Michel Giraud. Preview 2, the second of these discussions, will be heard next Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time, at which time Dorothy Gordon will have as her guest Monsieur Hervé Alphand, French ambassador to the United States. For the exact listening time in your area, please consult your local newspaper. This has been an NBC Radio Network presentation. The launching of America's astronaut into orbit later this month on NBC Radio.